You're listening to the Wannabes Mobcast. So we are about to have an extremely interesting, but also highly technical conversation with Corey Dice of Smart Carbs. One of the, he says, not the original inventor, but sounds like he knows his stuff. Um, well, so he know, knew the original inventor yeah. before he passed away. Inherited and has the kind technology. Of, yeah, taken it to the next right. level. So we, we won't belabor this point too much, but you might want to grab some notes uh, or note paper and strap in. This gets really technical. We found it extremely fascinating. Um, so stick with us and I think you'll learn a ton. Corey Dice. That's right. So here we are. We're uh, 12, 13? Yeah. What episode Thir- is this? This is episode 13. 13 episodes in, probably yep. close to oh, a wow. year. Oh, wow. Okay. Runners. So we do these monthly and... Uh, Anyway, cool. we're, we're excited to have you on. So I'm Cal. Thank you, John. Yeah. Um, we founded our little endeavor. And uh, so the way this came about is, uh, so we both ride two stroke KTM 300s and <laughs> Kel comes off of uh, a just recently, just recently. Yeah. I'm on my first uh, two stroke ever and I've been on it for about two months now. So one okay. of the first things he cool. did was he put the smart carb on it. Um, I was complaining about my car because it's starting to have issues. I had the stock Keenan, I think it's Keenan carburetor on there. Right. And um, you got it, you liked it, and you've been running it for a little while. And I was like, hey, you know, that would be a really cool conversation to have with you guys about the smart car, kind of how it came about, and, and um, sort of what the, the benefits and, and all that are compared to sure. regular carburetors, compared to, you know, the competition in the smart car space, and then also like fuel injection and throttle body injection, things like that. So right. I think the best place to start would be probably be um just the kind of the back story behind smart car because i understand you kind of were the initial creator or, or it, how, how, what is your kind of backstory with the smart car well the backstory really begins with the original inventor who created the whole lineage of the flat slide single circuit carburetors and that includes the electron and the quicksilver carburetors that <clears throat> he had sold to edelbrock sometime later so I am not the original inventor, but what we've done is taken basically the culmination of that man's life's work um, and continue to evolve it um, into a state where it's both, uh, it fits the new products, the modern products very well, but it's also able to go backward and fill in the space for, you know, the vintage and the historical lineage of motorcycles moving forward so um like as per our literature we talk a lot about you know the historical succession of the technology and basically what was delivered to us by the original inventor uh his name was william red edmonston he always went by red um was what the smart carb is today so it was about a 45 year developmental path that he finished up shortly before his passing so that's what we picked up from him the history really started with them around the late 1960s he invented a carburetor called the pause of fuel which was a float bolus design and it was just a flat metering rod grind and a flat slide so you had to start the vehicle and then turn the fuel on. Otherwise, it would flood because there was nothing to control the fuel flow. About a year later, he invented another carburetor called the Lake Injector. And it was following the same lines, but it was a little more distinct in that the earlier carburetor, the slide actually moved over the metering rod surface. And the second design actually moved the metering rod with the slide, which is typical of what we're doing today. Interestingly, only a few years passed, and then, like, boom, out came the Electron. You know, it, it kind of like it fell off a spaceship or something. It was so advanced from anything conventional at that time that when it was actually in production the next year, uh, it, it blew people away. They really didn't know what to think of it. And in fact, I think a lot of some of what's held the technology back from evolving more quickly was because it was so different and people didn't have any way to gauge or measure how to work with them compared to the conventional carburetors at the time. So 
over that period, he continued to evolve the technology and designed, I think, no less than six different iterations of it over a 20-year period. So what we wound up with was basically the 40-year culmination of his work with these carburetors. What's interesting, though, is this was not all that he was involved in. He was uh, he was recognized at one time as the who's who's inventors in the United States with over 100 patents to his name. That's a and pretty good run. S- some of those you might be familiar with are like the uh, the folding shopping carts, how they will fold up the back portion and they'll slide together. Oh, wow. uh, he, he actually invented that railroad cars that will fold the sides down so they can transport them more economically, efficiently uh, unloaded, you know, empty boxes. You could just fold them down and there was you know, a lot less aerodynamic drag against them. So he had quite a storied history and um, the smart car really kind of embodies that history. And it's a, it's always been an intriguing story to a lot of people and the future that it holds even is still uh very intriguing as we go forward because the thing about the smart carb and what makes it distinct from some of the other carbers he developed and those included um ones that went by the name of the ei carb um and the ei blue magnum and then they had the quicksilver carburetors that freddie spencer used for most of his storied career uh, to win races on and then the quicksilver twos which later sold to the Edelbrock Corporation. Each one of them, you know, making their way into production, but also improving subsequently over the earlier models. About the time I got to know him, he was working under a company he had named Atomized Fuel Technologies. And the smart car, which we'd later named, uh, at that time was called the AFT HVV. And that HVV stood for High Velocity Venturi. That's a name that's somewhat been later adopted by Lectron, but it's it's not the same Venturi shape. This has a very distinct shape that we're still using today. Where the HVV or the now Smart Carb was distinct over all of its predecessors is that it was designed specifically for lowering emissions. So in the late 1990s, there was a lot of political and environmental push to move two cycle powered equipment out of uh, the national parks and national monuments. And this was a Clinton era ban that came about because of the polluting nature of two cycle engines in Yellowstone primarily that use snowmobiles to, you know, access the park in the winter. How I met red was that, he was working with the National Park Service at the time to incorporate his new carburetor into what's known as best available technology for snowmobiles for use in the park because he had been able to develop it to where it would reduce upwards of 50% of the emissions in a two-cycle engine just with the fuel system alone. Wow. Later, he was working with catalytic converter exhaust systems to further reduce the emissions and I was working at the University of Wyoming at the time, uh, doing two cycle engine research, but also working with the collegiate design group who was doing the clean snowmobile challenge. And it was also held in Yellowstone. So that's how we got associated. Afterward, I was able to get him several contracts at the university to continue the development of the new carburetor. After working with him for a short period of time, the emissions reductions, the fuel economy gains was really pretty profound to the point that I had enough interest that I said, hey, I'll uh, I'll go out to Ann Arbor, Michigan with you and we'll work at EPA certifying the smart car, the HVV car at that time um, for best available technology. Where all the other carburetors were intended to ease the end user's problems of jetting air density compensation and all the things that, you know, have historically been an issue with the fuel systems on motorcycles. It was specifically designed to reduce emission, but it also still has the same performance characteristics. That's kind of the story behind the smart car. And then, you know, what we see as a future going forward with it today. 
it's a pretty impressive pedigree. I mean, 40, 45 years of, of uh, development. Um, while you were talking, I just started thinking my crazy brain. You were talking about shopping carts and we're talking about carburetors. And I just uh, started thinking, how can you merge those two? But uh, that's the nine year old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Destry Abbott had anything to say about it, it would be uh, just ride a KX500 and you get a shopping cart with a jet engine strapped to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. Huh? Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> right. So that's already been yeah, done. Very true. <laughs> yeah. No, but but uh, I mean that that's a that's an impressive story. I, I got to ask. I guess the first kind of question that comes top of mind is why isn't something like the smart carb the stock carburetor on every bike or most bikes? What what's holding that back, or, or is there any is there some kind of trade off that I'm not thinking of? I think it's a little bit complicated, and you know it would be hard to play out all the scenarios that have kept that from happening. Because when I first started working with Red, and I really began to understand what was happening because I was working on two cycle engine development and everything that I was doing was fuel injection. So naturally the status quo, uh, even where we still think today that that's the natural succession of fuel systems and the, the way that everybody's going to go. We had a full emissions certification laboratory there, dynos, everything to really kind of look at this thing in in depth and when i started seeing what it was capable of doing it really changed my opinion about fuel systems and probably the place they hold in the future going forward but it's a tough nut to crack because uh Makuni and kehan basically have had a stranglehold on this industry for a long time not every manufacturer looks at the smart carb in a way that we do in that if you really consider where Makuni and Kehan have made their money over all these years, it's selling jets, it's selling slides and needles and yeah, all the other sense. things that allow them the tunability for people to, you know, make changes in the field and suit their particular riding style and interests. It was an antithesis, as it were, to that gotcha. you know, commercial mindset. Secondly, it was so far ahead of its day um, that a lot of people didn't understand how to work with it. So there's a fear of um, both not understanding the product to get it to perform to your expectations, but also because it's a small nondescript company, is it going to be around long enough for me to continue to service the item? Or you know, am I going to be able to get metering rods or whatever right. over time to continue to go with it? So it, it's, it's had quite a stigma in that respect. That makes some me. sense. Furthermore, yeah. they've uh, had um, the thought of how am I going to get this thing tailored to my writing style or the things that I'm interested in doing with it. And because it was a single circuit, they saw it as it didn't have the ability to manipulate it to their liking. Interesting. That and you know the other reasons of manufacturing costs versus yeah. large volume costs has kind of kept it held back. But you would have thought sense. it'd been a slam dunk by now for sure. I mean, mm. I've loved mine. Um, I don't have that many, you know, a couple of months of experience with it, but it's it's definitely added a lot of benefits. The irony is that I think that most people, most average riders who try to tune their carb are probably not helping themselves uh, or not much anyway. <laughs> Be my guess. I see uh, plenty yeah, of it's one badly thing to, jetted. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> one thing to get the JD jet kit and follow the instructions, but like, for the most part, I think carburetors. Yeah, but but are you do that for like elevation change, which right. is yeah. the smart carb eliminates that problem. So without right. that, you're trying to tune it probably very wrong, from what we've seen. Right. Yeah. Most people don't have the the intuition or the sense yeah, about their carburetor works. to yeah. understand with a traditional carburetor what fine tuning actually does to the yeah. to the bike. Um, before we jump out of like kind of the background of this, do you have a background as a rider? I do. I grew up in Western Wyoming, a very remote part of Western Wyoming. Um, it's beautiful there. My grandparents were uh, power sports dealers. Um, they sold Hodaka, Kawasaki motorcycles, <clears throat> Polaris snowmobiles. Uh, you may remember the Gemini mini bikes that uh, had the fold up handlebars with the big brass knobs on them that, you know, you know, something you could pop out of the trunk and put together and ride. And uh, so, yeah, I, I grew up riding in really some of the most pristine area of the nation. 
not competitively, but um, we very much uh, made the best use of access to the country at that time. So that's cool. Um, I, uh, that's, I was just going to say uh, last year, uh, my wife and I took a road trip because um, there wasn't much else to do during COVID. And we drove up through Wyoming. To, we were headed to Colorado and, and um, took the bikes with us and got out and rode through Wyoming, some of the areas. Um, it's beautiful out there. Uh, it was more on the eastern side before you drop down into Colorado. But um, yeah, it's a beautiful country out there. I almost got ran over by an elk, and um, <laughs> right. which we don't have in California. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, that was a surprise. Yeah. Like, just cruising down the trail, and all of a sudden, this elk just goes right in front of us. Oh, God. Yeah. It's a different world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, uh, still a very nice place to be, though. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So we do we do miss living out there. Uh, I think we should jump into the smart car. Yeah. And just I, talk about what it does. Like, Do you want to take a second and just kind of explain how the smart carb works? What, it, what are the, the benefits? The idea behind the flat slide single circuit carburetors was really to um, lineate the, the fuel delivery. So a big problem with conventional carburetors are the multiple circuits. So we have a certain amount of overlap in those circuits and we have to tailor uh, the fine tuning to both work within the constraints of the overlaps, but also the primary function of each circuit. So the pilot system, the air screw, the needle jet, the nozzle jet, and the main jet all have a separate function, but they have to intertwine and, and work together to provide, you know, smooth fueling and power delivery. The first notion was to, you know, eliminate the overlap and the changing of circuits. Secondarily, because we're not using jets, there's nothing to mute or diminish what we refer to as the fluid communication between balancing the ambient air density which is the true driving force of the fuel compared to trying to work around orifices that can alter the way the fuel is delivered based on air density changes. What I mean by that is a lot of people think that fuel is pulled into the engine by a vacuum, which in a sense it is, but that's the inverse notion of how that really works. What is happening is the piston creates a depression, atmosphere pushes fuel into that depression so the venting of the float bowl is really important with the way that it drives fuel no oh, sorry otherwise you'd create a, a vacuum in the float bowl right like the, if you didn't vent well it, it's like holding your finger over a yeah. straw if you can't backflow then right. nothing will come out right mm. so all all flow bowls are vented to atmosphere where the difference lies is that the smart carb takes the air from right in front of the venturi bell and applies that as the absolute pressure against the fuel in the float bowl because it's not using jets then that communication between air density and the pressure being applied to the fuel in the float bowl is instantaneous and there's nothing in the way like a jet to slow it down so the premise is that we're able to balance air density pressure against the fuel that's flowing out of the float bowl based on the the depression that the engine is creating known as vacuum so the fluid flow is immediate and it's correct for the amount of air that's flowing through the carburetor interesting mm. regardless of like elevation pressure changes things like that correct but it compensates so right. because let's say at sea level, we've got roughly 14.7 PSI of air pressure. So that pressure increases the fuel driving force, which richens the mixture to compensate mm -hmm. for the sea level pressures. If we go up to 10,000 feet, we have less air pressure. So the fuel flow rate is slowed down because of the less air pressure and it compensates right. in that way. So you so maintain it only your, your ratio. Is there right. any elevation range where that would start to not work anymore i mean does it continue indefinitely i mean obviously at some point you're not going to ride up you know 14 15 000 Taking my feet. Bike to space yeah <laughs> right it'll launch it no it corrects for elevation changes um we've actually flown them up to twenty three thousand feet in Whoa. um uav drones 
with our motorcycles, what we notice is that normally after about 10 to 12,000 feet from a sea level setting, we may want to make one or two adjustments with the external clicker leaner just to make up for the lack mm-hmm. of air density. But it's never anything as great as changing a metering rod or you know any real in-depth tuning to correct for those changes. I think it's probably the important thing to note is that smart carbs are not just made for motorcycles. Like I'm purely thinking of it within a motorcycle context, but you're making it for snowmobiles. You're making it for planes. It sounds like drones. Um, Is there, is it mostly focused on two cycle engines or is it for four strokes as well? No, it's, it works equally well on a four stroke or a two stroke. In fact, probably arguably a little bit better on a four stroke simply because of the cleaner separation of the intake and the exhaust Mm -hmm. and also a better signal, which is again, the vacuum or the communication that the carburetor is receiving from the engine where we haven't really gone into the four stroke market in terms of motorcycles is that there's a, there's a couple of reasons. One is, um, on a big four strokes, like say a 450, there is a lot of engine vacuum. So a flat slide um, carburetor that's uh, designed to clearly open and close the rate of air through the carburetor has a lot of suction against it. And so if you've noted over the years that like a Kihan FCR has uh, both rollers on the slide, but it has a push-pull throttle cable. And the idea is so that you have a more positive control over the slide opening and closing and not relying on just a spring to do the work. We haven't really wanted to go into the four-stroke market too far without having the correct type of throttling mechanism that is really necessary for those bikes. That makes a lot of sense. I've seen old carbs where the slide's worn down and isn't isn't sliding properly yeah. so I, I know what you're talking about um right i've torn apart the the carburetor on the 2007 uh, the ktm uh, exc 500 um it has a barrel carb with the two cables and it has rollers on it and mm-hmm. it had so much suction on it that the rollers actually wore into the the housing right. of the uh, right. carburetor exactly. which caused it to mm-hmm. create a, a vacuum issue and uh, it didn't work. Yeah, it could never find idle. It would always kind of hunt around for, for its idle position. Right. And so that's really a major safety issue. So we haven't really wanted to dive into that with our current model. We have actually designed a four-stroke model. Uh, we're continuing the development of it. And it has a mechanical linkage for the slide in order to be able to actuate Directly in a four stroke. The beauty of that model also is that we can rack it together. So, for um, like say older uh, vintage Japanese motorcycles that have three or four carburetors, um, these will work well for them, even if they're a two stroke, because they run a common throttle linkage. That's and you eliminate all the cables and stuff that go with that. So, yeah, that, um, that's, that's very interesting. I had an old uh, XR coming. that had dual carbs. So, um, kind of going back to what you were talking about with the different phases of the power, the, the bottom end, the mid range and the, the top end controlled by the different jets. When you eliminate all of that, you basically eliminate the potential for there to be flat spots throughout the power band. Is that correct? Well, we do. And we don't look at the smart carb like you have the, the ability to tailor any of those zones is because it does that for you. So meaning it's a very demand sensitive system. So what it does is based on the signal that it receives from the motor, good or bad, the general health of an engine always helps the smart carb, you know, a good solid engine. And it will simply pull the proportional amount of fuel that's required for that throttle position based on that load. So a lot of guys will say, well, I want a real sudden hit. I I like a real sudden pipe hit. And they feel that the smart carb won't deliver that because it's such a linear type of delivery. The power is there. It just may require a little more twist of the throttle to get the same hit that you're looking for. But it's not, it's not like it's something you need to tailor in or out uh, to get a desired effect. Okay. It uh, simply does it based on demand. 
it's really interesting the way you're talking about the the vacuum of the engine as like a, a signal or communication. Um, I I'd, I'd never thought of that kind of framing, but I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of understanding how the whole thing is functioning. I like that. Right. All right. Your your engine is kind of in a way talking to your carburetor, yeah. telling through, it what through, it needs through vacuum. Yeah. I, mean, I never would have thought about it. That right. Way. And in that respect, uh, somewhat going backward in that, um, you know, the marketing of a product like this, how do you build a consumer confidence? Um, how do you let people understand this is something that you really need? Because a lot of people think they can jet just fine or they're perfectly happy with the stock carburetor, which is great, uh, no doubt. But the advantages over a system that it is able to continuously compensate and adjust for any changes throughout the day's ride is a huge advantage to you. And you don't need to know a lot in order to get the thing dialed in. Probably our biggest challenge with this fuel system has not really been the development of it or how to get it marketed in the masses' hands. We spend most of our time educating people on what rich and lean means. <laughs> okay. Um, and I dare say that we've probably educated a lot of customers and have actually had them step away from us because now they know enough to tune the carburetor that they had already. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how you build a, a uh, an effective business, though, I think, is, right, is sort of right. be generous so, with what you teach people. So. Yeah. So education has been our, our biggest challenge, but it's also that's something right. we enjoy. Well, I so. certainly appreciated when I installed mine here recently, the the documentation that came with it around exactly that. What's what's rich? What's lean? How do you get it tuned? Um, right. Yeah, I knew the principles for most of it, but it was very helpful. And it was kind of, I, I like the way you guys lay it out. Um, certainly helped me Thank think you. through and realize what I was doing. While we're on how the thing works, you want to talk a minute about the the slide? Um, I think we, we, I don't know if there's anything additional to add there, but I think for me, it was a little kind of trippy to get my head around. Okay, there's not like a bunch of jets. I've got this slide and or metering rod that you call it. Um, that's what I'm trying trying to get after. Well, uh, the flat slide or a guillotine slide is what it was called originally. Does the most effective job of gating the air. So, okay. like a round slide VM Makuni carburetor, a lot of air can slip around the slide. Well, any air that gets around the slide is air that's not going past the metering rod, and therefore it's not contributing anything to proper metering. So you actually have to make up for that unmetered air. So a flat slide, especially with the dual gates, is probably the most effective method to completely force all the air to go underneath the slide, cut away, and direct it at the metering rod. This, again, amplifies the signal or the way the carburetor is able to respond to the airflow going through it. So a flat slide is much more effective at sealing internally than say a round slide or a partially arcute slide or something like that. The downside was just what we were talking about a minute ago is that it creates such a force of stiction that it can be a problem in a big four stroke. Yeah, that's interesting. But that's the reasoning. And then the, the metering rod is just, that's the way you give throttle input. Uh, I mean, the slide too, but the metering rod is how you control like the rate of flow of fuel that's possible given given the, the vacuum condition. Is that at all accurate? The grind angle of the metering rod is what controls the okay. fuel flow proportional to throttle position. But to not oversimplify what the metering rod actually does in these type of fuel systems, we need to elaborate a little bit more because the metering rod is is really the secret um, to how these things function so effectively. More importantly, how they atomize the fuel. So the metering rod is not just a round rod with a flat grind on it. It it is that's that's how it's formed, but its functions actually embody several different aspects. So without giving everything away because I'm sure my competitors will probably be looking at this as well. It's doing quite a few different things. So one is it's a wake generator. It's a divider. It's uh, creating divergence in the airflow that causes a depression zone on the backside of the metering rod. That's what lifts the fuel out of the float bowl along with the driving force created by the float bowl pressurization circuit that we talked about a little bit ago. 
but these two work in tandem. So that helps pull fuel out of the float bowl. Um, secondarily, it creates a shear surface along the flat edge of the metering rod grind angle that creates a, a whipping of the air, as it were, along with the fuel that breaks it down into very small, small particles of fuel vapor. It also sets up a resonance frequency. Um, if you think of how your antenna used to whistle going down the road in an old car, um, that resonance also is a function to helping break down the long chain hydrocarbons. Because if you, if you look at a carburetor or fuel system in its simplest form, it's only really designed to do a couple of things. One is it's to break down a liquid fuel into a fine vapor. Um, the second function is to maintain the ideal air, re- air fuel ratios while doing that. So when you can consider what the metering rod does, both in terms of reading air density by the air that's being wrapped around it, along with a shear effect created by the divergence, you can see why we're able to get a very fine vapor off of these metering rods. So again, back to the smart carb and where it varies with um, the earlier predecessors is the shape of the Venturi. So the shape of the Venturi is designed to amplify and magnify the signal to the metering rod at all throttle positions. So to put that in another context, the reason Electron has to use a power jet is because it can't maintain enough signal to the metering rod above half throttle for it to continue to pull fuel proportional to the airflow. So they have to augment it with the secondary circuit. The smart carb keeps the signal at the metering rod. Where it ever lacks, then the pressure in the float bowl overrides that and continues to drive fuel up the nozzle and into the airstream. Kind of like an inverse power jet. But the beauty of it is all the fuel is leaving the metering rod under a vapor state, not raw fuel being squirted in through a tube. That's a lot to get your head around. I think I get what you're saying, but no, it's (laughs) it's fascinating. I, I, uh, first of all, had never thought that there was this much that goes into carburetors. I mean, I assumed they were relatively simple. So this is pretty interesting. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by the comparison of fuel atomization between a regular carburetor smart carburetor um, and like fuel injection or, or TBI. Cause I think I read on your website that the fuel atomization of the smart carburetor is actually finer than the fuel injection. Is that, is that correct? Uh, most fuel injections. Yeah, that is correct. Um, with the exception of a pneumatically assisted direct injection or something very sophisticated, um, conventional fuel injection does not vaporize the fuel to the level that the smart carb does. That's really cool. How do you yeah. how do you measure fuel atomization? I'm imagining there's some sophisticated tool that does that, but I'm kind of curious to know how that actually works. There is now. Um, when we first started measuring particulate size, we were doing it at the University of Wyoming, and we were actually using a uh, a uh, grid with a particular square sizing on the back of it, and we were running it through basically wind tunnels at that time and we were taking photographs of the particulate sizing relative to the background grid so it was pretty archaic but we were able to measure that pretty accurately based on the sizing of the grid to the particle size Um, later we started using um, laser planar imaging so we're actually shooting a plane of a laser beam across the fuel spray and we're able to measure the particle size that way. I was gonna say that sounds really high tech. That's uh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I like that. yeah, it's pretty accurate. Yeah, but it shows us that we can vaporize fuel in a smart carb, in a lot of cases, down to less than ten microns. And to put that in perspective, a modern fuel injector is somewhere between twenty and forty microns. Wow, that's a pretty big difference. So that that really plays into the. Well, two things. It's the the power delivery because the finer the atomization, the more thorough the burn. The more thorough the burn, the more power you get per particulate of extracting from the gas from the individual yeah. piece of fuel. But that also plays a role in the fuel economy as well, right? You burn more of the fuel, the more the 
fuel goes further. Is that probably a really crude understanding? <laughs> you're getting there. <laughs> no, it, you're correct. Emissions reduction and fuel economy go hand in hand. Okay, so again, the the premise behind really with Red putting the smart car up to next level was to maintain the use of a single circuit metering rod so that all the fuel coming out of the carburetor would be vaporized. That leads to both an emissions reduction and an improvement in fuel economy. So when we test carburetors or any engine for that matter, um, we're measuring what we call brake specific fuel consumption. And what that is, is how much work did we do in what period of time using how much fuel? Okay. So if you're getting a increase in fuel economy, say of 30%, like we typically see on a two stroke, it's tuned right with a smart carb. And that really correlates to a 30% reduction in emissions as well, because we've done more work or the same amount of work in the same period of time, but we've used less fuel doing so. That makes sense. It, you mentioned that your prior work before you got into the smart carb project was with fuel injection systems. And then you said something kind of tantalizing that you, this, this concept changed your thinking around the future of, of fuel systems. When I first got the smart carb and started thinking about how it was working, I assumed that you'd gotten most of the benefits of, of fuel injection, except for changes in fuel mapping across the throttle range. But it's sounding like maybe you're actually getting that out of what you're calling the signal from the engine. Um, you're getting, maybe I, I don't know, you, you want to talk about um, what your thinking is and how this relates to fuel injection in your prior work? Yeah, let me back up just a little bit to clarify. So what I was doing, I was, um, we were developing low emissions two cycle engines. Okay. So I was working at the university of Wyoming when I met red. Um, so we, we as well were focused on the future of our sport and knew that emissions was going to be a big part of the program. So I invented a, a two stroke engine that we were working with and naturally I adopted a fuel injection system to it. So I was doing all my research based on the ability to digitally control the fuel delivery, uh, to work with, you know, the platform that we were developing. Um, and, and it was working okay, but once I really began to understand how the smart car was functioning, and how that it was doing exactly the same things that we're trying to ask a computer to crunch all these numbers to do, um, it, it changed my opinion. So let me see if I can elaborate that on just a little bit. So there's two things that primarily control a fuel injection system today, and they might be terms you've heard of, maybe not. But one is we have a mass airflow meter. Okay, so the engine is reading the mass airflow coming into the engine. And it's augmenting the injection timing and the amount that it injects and everything based on the air that's coming into the engine. So that's a critical sensor on a fuel injected car. Um, we have another sensor we call the MAP sensor, and that stands for manifold absolute pressure. So when you're measuring a flow of anything, you're measuring the velocity of the flow, but you also have to measure what we call the, the Reynolds number which is the pressure that the flow is under. So you have MAP and MAV. So if you look at a smart car, we have both of those things going on. This scoop right here, this is our flowable pressurization circuit. Yep. This is a manifold absolute pressure sensor. So it's reading the air density that's right in front of the Venturi bell. It's applying that pressure to the top of the fuel in the float bowl. So that's driving the fuel up the nozzle. The metering rod, which is not in this carburetor, but the round surface of it is reading um, mass airflow. So we've got the metering rod meeting, reading mass airflow. We've got the vent scoop reading manifold absolute pressure. So that balancing act is creating the same effect that we're getting out of a fuel injection system that is augmenting the injection rate. What this changes is the fueling rate based on the communication between those two driving forces. So 
when I understood that, and then I recognized that the metering rod itself is creating a better vapor than injecting a liquid fuel through an injector and expecting it to atomize in those few milliseconds, it became clear that this was really a superior setup going forward. Interesting. And so that's, that's where I decided that um, I, I wanted to continue along with Red and help him to propagate the technology so that it could have a place in the world because of the benefits that it, it really provides. That makes a lot of sense. I had never thought of fuel injection as kind of asking a computer to kind of do some arbitrary math around assumptions of what's happening with what you've built with the smart carb kind of pairs those two things together in a, in a I mean, a mechanical way, but nonetheless, maybe more sophisticated in the end. Yeah. It, it, when you consider that everything that is causing the fuel to come through the motor is based on physics and air density then it can only do exactly what those readings are telling it to do so you don't have to get a computer to to make those changes it's it's more instantaneous and it's more accurate right that's so fascinating it's blowing my mind yeah me too (laughs) so there's there's one element that i think uh, you know i for most motorhead guys like us you know the the thing that we're thinking about when we go to make a buying decision and looking at smart carbs if you have a two stroke or a four stroke bike that's fuel or um, carbureted is like the, the power characteristics you're thinking about you know how i can spend more money to make myself go faster basically um i, I think that's one area we need to touch on is is like how how does the smart carb affect the power band. I know there's there's an overall increase in the amount of power that you get from installing a, a smart carbon. I understand that that comes from the finer fuel atomization and the, and the cleaner burn. But yeah, can we just kind of touch on on that and, and the power characteristics that you'd expect to get from installing a smart carb? Well, and, and maybe related to um, if I understand the literature correctly, the different carburetor barrel size uh, or maybe yeah. the inlet size. I'm not sure. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Outlet size. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. A couple questions there. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. Um, how and why are modern motorcycle off road manufacturers going to fuel injection? Okay. What are the the perceived advantages from the consumer? Are one, I don't have to jet anymore. Okay. So it's not going to be up to me to tune the system. Um, it'll take care of most of that for me. Um, secondarily, manufacturers are under compunction from regulatory agencies to, you know, start working on the emission side of the off-road world, which up till now has been basically unregulated or unless you're in California where they found another way of taxation. Um, we are in California. we we're very familiar with the pain of all to, that. <laughs> <laughs> to ride, right? Yep. Um, the question is asked us all the time. So why have manufacturers begun adopting fuel injection systems on two-stroke off-road motorcycles? And the answers are a little bit varied, but it's not because they're inherently any cleaner. Because if you consider that in what we call a, a crankcase scavenged two-stroke, like we're all using today, where we're you know, pulling air and fuel through the crankcase, we're mixing oil with it, we're using a port layout where there's a certain amount of overlap between the intake ports and the exhaust port, there's always going to be a certain amount of losses, short-circuiting of the fresh charge that gets out the exhaust pipe, no matter how efficient they are. So it really comes down to a fuel injection system on a conventional two-stroke that we're using on a dirt bike is not going to be any cleaner than a well-tuned carburetor, okay? Because it can't overcome the scavenging losses. That's where direct fuel injection comes in, where they are able to inject fuel after the exhaust port, the intake ports have closed, and eliminate any fuel getting out of the combustion chamber that way. So... It's more of an optics than it is an actual solution to the emissions problem. But where I feel that the, the real interest in having all vehicles fuel injected is that then they are able to be plugged into an onboard diagnostic computer 
that the regulatory agencies can say yay or nay that this thing is falling within compliance. So like right now, you can't do that with a carbureted bike because there's nothing to tell tell them what's happening. So it really kind of comes down to basically governmental oversight in order to monitor the emissions coming from these products by being able to do a diagnostic sweep. Hmm. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Sadly. <laughs> but they're not any cleaner. Right. And they don't, per- they don't make the power. So we want to talk about that just a little bit longer. The transfer port fuel injection that KTM came out with in 2017, in my opinion, was always a bad design because you're trying to inject the fuel into the incoming airstream that's coming out of the crankcase. That's bad for a couple of reasons. One is a two-stroke that fires every crank revolution really appreciates the wet flow nature of a carburetor or a fuel system that's delivering the fuel through the crankcase. That wicks a lot of heat out of the motor. It also promotes lubrication. It also helps vaporize the fuel coming off the hot engine components before it actually makes its way into the combustion chamber. So during our couple of years of following the hard enduro scene around, you can smell and hear that the TPI bikes are running very hot. And the reason they're running hot is because they're trying to run them as lean as they can to keep the fuel economy up, keep the emissions down for the whole purpose that they intended the fuel injection system to be in the beginning. Well, you may have noticed that after 2019, 2020, we first noticed it on Colton Haker's bike at Tough Like Roar that they had blocked off the TPI injectors and went to a throttle body injection. So now they're back to that this year. So the conclusion of that is the TPI system was stressing the motor by not cooling it enough, was not manageable, that they went back to a conventional throttle body injector to continue going forward with their fuel injection systems. That That was real clear to everybody, but basically they've stepped back away from (laughs) what the optics were of them going to a fuel injection system. So what we say is with a two-stroke, wetter is better. So if you can carry wet, uh, cold fuel through the motor, the performance is going to be improved. The engines are going to run freer and more efficiently. And, you know, you've got a better overall solution. So that's what KTM has gone back to. Got it. So throttle body injection is is kind of like a electronically controlled carburetor. Carburetor. Yeah, it, it really doesn't. We're back to where we started. It's just a... Right. Attach the computer to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we're going to continue to see manufacturers probably beginning to follow suit toward the fuel injection side simply because the regulatory agencies are going to require them to do onboard monitoring. Mm-hmm. And that's the way that they can do it. Where we see our future coming in with that, again, to share some. <sighs> some of our you know development because we have a fuel system that we can control the mixtures from externally meaning our clicker adjuster well that lends itself to give us the ability to do on the fly adjustment of the metering rod in real time so we are working with several ways of doing that and it will be a closed loop system providing feedback from an o2 sensor that will allow us also to interface with an engine control module that can be monitored um, and read for what it's doing on the fuel system side. It's fascinating. So we have that ability to tie in as well. Could you, um, in that case, with that setup, convert a TBI bike to a system running the smart carb, or would that not be compatible? You need the computer. It's already being done with the TPI bikes. Okay. Um, there's a good number of people that have figured out a way to work around the system and put a smart carb on it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. um, in fact, we get hit up. To, people ask us if we have a kit available yet in order to do that. A, a, a TPI delete kit? <laughs> yeah, right. For, for trackage only? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Right. Um, we, uh, I wanted to really quickly grab the piece about the, the size of the carburetor outlet 
and how that impacts um, power. I know for my bike, there were a couple of options and some in the literature, some description of whether you impacted top or bottom end with the size choice. Well, naturally, there's always been a, a trade-off in a conventional sense of um, gaining bottom end over absolute max top end power by running a smaller carburetor. Um, so if you're uh, specific about your wants and needs, you know, for instance, if you're, you know, a hard enduro racer, you want all your power down low, very tractable, very predictable, not so much concerned about the top end then a smaller throat carburetor is your is what you need. Uh, if you're desert racing, GNCC, hill climbing, snow biking, anything like that where you're more or less pinned, then the larger carburetors will will take over and you know give you the top end power you're looking for. What's kind of unique about the smart carb is we don't have the same trade off because the shape of the Venturi between a thirty six 38 or 40 under half throttle is almost the same cross-sectional area. It's only above half throttle that the larger size re really begin to, to take over. So we don't really have the traditional trade-off in losing bottom end in favor of top end by running a slightly larger carburetor. Okay, that's interesting. So I, I ended up going with the 38. Um, we do a lot of hard enduro, but where I really want the most that I can get out of the bike is for the big hill climbs that we try to do. Um, we have a lot of fun yeah. with those. So I, I ended up going with the 38 and haven't been disappointed, but yeah. it sounds like I wasn't mm -hmm. giving up any, or I'm not giving up bottom end really anyway. So No, not really. Um, not really, but you'll have more power on the top. Yeah. I think the thing that yeah. I'm still trying to wrap my head around is is what variable Venturi actually means. Can you kind of explain that as a concept? It actually applies to any slide style carburetor. So apart from like an automotive carburetor that uses butterfly valves, mm -hmm. um, any slide carburetor is referred to as a variable Venturi because you're changing the opening top to bottom. So oh, that's, that's yeah. where the term comes from. Ours is probably more of a variable variable Venturi because of the shape that we've given it to you know, project the airflow right at the metering rod. That's for, the shape of the, the channel on the bottom that runs across the, the rod, right? That's what you're talking about. The whole shape of the Venturi actually, um, it's, it's like an inverted egg shape. Yeah. You okay. Know? So okay. it's, it really comprises a smaller circle and then a larger circle kind of blended together. Right. But there's also an annular shape you know, based on the curvature and stuff that also helps to shape the air and create a projection point of airflow against the metering rod. Makes sense. Hmm. That's what I was thinking about. So I know we're <laughs> coming up on time and I'm, I am really fascinated by this. So uh, I think we just hang in there for a few more minutes. I have a few more questions sure. I wanted to ask. Um, yeah. I want to know more about the kind of the maintenance and, and anything that you would have to do. Okay. So I've, I've installed my smart carb. It's running, it's tuned. What do I have to worry about after that? Is there any maintenance, any parts that could possibly need to be replaced failure points that you'd want to be concerned about things to that nature? Well, there's a few serviceable items in the carburetor, like a couple of O rings and things like that. But again, because we're no, not running any small orifices or jets, anything like that, there's, there's very little maintenance uh, to worry about, and there's very little to worry about getting clogged or plugged up over, like, say, off-season storage or something like that. Oh, I hadn't so, thought about that. You're not going to clog all those jets because they aren't in there. Right. Interesting. And that's always what happens right. uh, when we let one crystallize or set up. So, no, um, we, we typically don't even recommend a rebuild till about three years mm -hmm. of use, even then. So there's nothing in there really to wear out, uh, very few moving parts, and no small orifices to plug or, or get gummed up. Um, if you're not riding it for a period of time, you've always got the ability to just drain it with the float bowl drain. Or some people prefer to put a stabilizer in the fuel, and that kind of conditions the O-rings and stuff inside the carburetor so they don't dry out. Makes but sense. Either um, way, there's nothing sophisticated or special trying to take care of one i i love it i 
bought it originally before I really understood what it did because of the uh, eliminating the elevation changes. But the more I hear, the more I like the uh, low maintenance. But uh, how does the how does the, the tip over seal system work? Right, it's not gonna it doesn't leak out all over the place, which is great. I've tried that out already. Um, bike upside yeah, down. You've had the bike hill. completely <laughs> upside down, um, and I like that. But I, I was a little nervous because. I've had this, the, the float um, ball or whatever that they put in the gas cap thing to prevent the, the vent line for the fuel tank from leaking. I've had those plug up and pressurize the fuel tank doing like high elevation mm-hmm. stuff or whatever. Um, how does that work in the smart carb? And is there ever a chance of running into that and some way to fix it if it happens? Or is it unrelated? For one thing, the, the tip over valves uh, protection is something we created that Mr. Edmonston did not have um, in the carburetor when we first started working with it. So um, it was, uh, again, a safety issue yep. uh, with the consumer and product user and uh, something we developed. So what it is, it's kind of a dual phase uh, system. There's two uh, check balls on each side of the carburetor where the vent passageways go into the float bowl. Um, two of the balls are a very light hollow plastic so should the float valve stick those drift up and shut the vents off so it can't pour fuel straight into the motor on a tip over or you know not if but when we drop our bike when (laughs) uh, it has stainless steel balls in there that force the plastic balls into the seats and again shuts the fuel off so it keeps it from overflowing uh, when the bike's laying on the ground those can get a little dirty gummy over time that may need a little cleaning. Uh, very simple to do. Just uh, basically squirt carburetor cleaner down in there and blow it out, but they don't cause any pressurization problems or any type of blockage or anything like that that can happen, but they, they do require a little cleaning once in a while. Okay, fair enough. I, I love that, that, that they're in there. I mean, that's one of the sort of major usability drawbacks of a carburetor in practice is you ride like we do a lot of hill climbs and a lot of times you don't make it and you drop the bike and and you got fuel running all over you yeah i didn't realize how much my bike leaks fuel everywhere until i started looking at your Mm -hmm. bike and it's like perfectly clean there's no fuel dribbling out every time i stop it's really nice yeah Yeah. (laughs) i like it right Conventional carburetors do have an overflow, mm-hmm. and if the floats aren't set correctly, then most people don't even notice it. They just they just ride with it anyway, but they lose quite a bit of fuel on the ground. Um, one of the misnomers, I guess, with our improved fuel economy, and there's some merit in this, but a lot of guys will they'll loop their lines up underneath the tank, you know, which keeps that from happening in most cases anyway. Mm-hmm. And there's some gain there in fuel economy, but it's not because we're not venting outside. Most of the fuel economy gains comes with the smart car because of the vaporization potential. Right. The not losing fuel is just a nice perk to go along with it. Yeah. I mean, if, you're, if your carb is tuned really well, it's not going to lose much anyway, hopefully, like dribbling out all over. Correct. Um, yeah. Which makes me think now, just sort of thinking out loud. In your float bowl, do you have any, is there, I guess there's not anything like a traditional float, is there? Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, we use a set of pot plastic uh, pontoon floats. Oh, okay, so there's a similar and, concept to prevent uh, yeah. uh, fuel flowing when yeah. the bike is off, I guess. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. A conventional needle and seat. Gotcha. But because we don't have an overflow, we do recommend that you do have some good personal hygiene with shutting the fuel off. Okay. Naturally, when you're not riding it. And, you know, that's always been critical with a two-stroke with premix anyway. You may remember, and maybe even on your KTM, they, they put a big old paddle out there for the petcock so you couldn't rem- not remember, you yeah. know, to shut it off. And the reason is, is because the weight of the fuel and that little bit of oil in there, it'll eventually work its way past that valve over time, and it'll start flooding the motor. Oh, interesting. So, I- any car hmm. will do that, but it's okay. a good idea to shut it off. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. I never fully understood the reasoning behind that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I have to imagine somebody in your position here is uh, misleading or just flat out wrong ideas about fueling systems around motorcycles in general, two stroke or four stroke. Is there anything that you can think of off the top of your head that you would like to debunk? Well, the fuel injection thing on two strokes is, is um, it's unnecessary at this point. And so for manufacturers 
to feel compelled to have to do something for merely an optics standpoint. Um, with KTM, I think their earnest desire is they want to be the front runner in the market. They have the deepest pockets, and so therefore they were able to be kind of the first first to come to it. But like I said earlier, with a two-stroke that you're scavenging the airflows through the crankcase, it has nothing to do with the way you're delivering the fuel in terms of an emissions reduction. You can control the quality, the quantity of the fuel flow a little better digitally, but you don't have the quality of the fuel flow like the smart carb delivers. So it's not necessary like everybody thinks that that it, it has to be fuel injected going forward. Well, there are enough manufacturers interested in what we're bringing to the table to at least consider staving that off, you know, for as long as they possibly can. It makes sense because there's a lot of, I call it baggage that goes along with fuel injection. I mean, there's some nice features um, in terms of usability of the bike, but you've got to run this whole electrical system. You know, you've got injectors that can fail. It's harder to, you know, potentially harder if your battery dies. There's all kinds of stuff we see on the trail. Yeah, there's some um, horror stories that, like, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Megan Griffiths, Meg's Rock. She bought a, um, yeah, a, that yeah. two stroke, uh, she has the, the TPI, yeah. the Husqvarna. And she's had nothing right. but terrible experiences with it. I think KTM and Husqvarna both have kind of gotten run through the mud a little bit on their design of that because, you know, you spend twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars setting up a bike and and then you get it and all of a sudden you've got electrical wires here, there, and everywhere. And you know, you've got a but system. You gotta that run you, a fuel pump, you need more yeah. watts out of your statter. Like there's just so much that goes into it. It's it's not a simple right. system. I look at the irony of that actually because what has kept the two strokes relevant all these years is they're simple yeah. and they're lightweight. Right. So when you start complicating that, then you're really starting to delve into the four stroke world. And, and the question begins to be asked why a lot of credit is given to KTM in essence for basically keeping the two stroke market alive for all those years where the Japanese manufacturers were stepping away into four stroke platforms, you know, the subjugate manufacturers under KTM, you know, gas, gas, uh, TM, Fantic, you know, some of the other ones have always, you know, maintained that, that simple two stroke platform as well. So for KTM to be the one to come out overly complicating a two stroke when they're kind of the ones that have been attributed <laughs> yeah with keeping them relative all these years is, is pretty ironic for me. Hmm. I mean, it's, um, it's a good point. I, um, a couple of years ago, I bought a 21 500 KTM 500, um, brand new bike, built it out for, for basically enduro riding, but just about as big and complicated as you can get with a dirt bike. And I've since the smart carb that I'm running is actually on a 2006, uh, 300 XCW. So just kind of the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of, small, uncomplicated, not new. Um, and, and I just, I've actually had such a better experience with it because there's very little that can go wrong with it. It weighs a lot. I mean, obviously the riding experience in a two strokes quite, quite interesting, but I just love that there's, there's nothing in the bike. There's very little by way of electrical. Um, there's no fuel pump or injection system to worry about. There's not a complicated computer to upgrade. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's very straightforward and I really like that. Interestingly, I think that, you know, all the way back to 2006, the bike is competitive or, or yeah. better in many cases than the 500 was um, right. and, and very competitive. So I, I would love to see that market stay alive. Um, I think that's where the interesting riding happens. I, I think one other side to your question there, though, before we go, is that um, the difference between a fuel injection system for a two stroke and a four stroke are, are very different. Um, it's much harder to, to fuel inject a two stroke than it is a four cycle engine. And again, it's because of the separation of the intake and exhaust processes, uh, a better platform to which incorporate electronics and things like that. And then we've known for a lot of years that snowmobiles and outboard marine engines, uh, two strokes, twin cylinders mainly do really well with fuel injection, but those engines more or less run at a very steady state. Um, you know, a clutch drive on a snowmobile or an outboard marine engine, they're not as transient in nature that a 
a two stroke with a gearbox is. So there's really quite a few complications to perfecting one on a on an off road dirt bike. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I would still argue that even even given that a lot of the guys that we've ridden with have had fuel pumps go out in the middle of a ride. It's just a whole yeah. other system that you've got to make sure is up and running. You know, especially if you're doing adventure riding or something where you're out in the wilderness a bit. Yeah, um, right. It's not something mechanical that you can fix with your hands. You know, if, yeah, if you're right. mechan- if your carburetor is having a problem and you're down in the tip of Baja and you're you're trying to figure out how to, you know you can you can usually take it apart, clean conjure it, conjure together something that works. But if your if your fuel pump disintegrates, you know, internally, which I we've had happen on the earlier models, I think we had a, a 2009 Husqvarna before it was bought by KTM, it was stolen by BMW, and they had a, a one of the earlier model fuel injected four strokes and the fuel pump just disintegrated and and we bought like three or four of them before we decided to sell the bike and get rid of it because it was like these things are these, yeah. these fuel pumps are just not holding up it's ridiculous yeah so right yeah yeah um, complicated and costly right right for sure yeah. well I'm, I'm loving this smart carb let's say that um and we've immensely enjoyed talking with you i i um i think a Thank lot you. of it is like right up at the top of what I can uh, grasp in terms of my technical competency, but very much appreciate you taking the time to explain it to us. Um, Fascinating. And I, I got to go ponder this for a while and see if I can get my head around all the, (laughs) the the technical aspects, but I love it. Um, And and we've had a lot of fun. So we appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I enjoyed your installation video and stuff. I thought it was really well done. Oh, good. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you guys had had a chance to see that. We just, uh, we released twice a week. So that one just went out. So yeah, very quick and dirty. Um, We don't spend a ton of time on production value, but we do try to to share our uh, experiences and um, so on with our followers. So yeah, I think it really comes down to like everything in the dirt bike industry and everybody who rides, you know, when you find something you like, you want to share it with everybody you know. So Smart yeah, right. definitely in that category. Yeah, oh, I, I, I'm, a, cool. I'm a huge fan. I've absolutely loved it so far. Yeah, now I, I have to go and buy one. We're, uh, we're going to get John on one too here shortly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So well, we look forward to hooking you up. All right. Definitely. Cool. Here well, you thank you. Thanks really appreciate time. it. Take care. Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Bye. Bye. Wow. I don't think there's room in my head for any new information for like the next week. I need to just like process all of that. Uh, (laughs) He really like, I I was so impressed at how he broke down the information into, you know, what is for the lay person, incredibly advanced physics. How do you make it digestible? And makes, turns it into uh, comprehensible concepts and relatable, just information that you can uh, understand and apply to your riding, uh, which conveniently also means like, hey, you don't need to do all these complicated things. You know, if you buy a smart carb, there's less maintenance, there's higher performance, yeah. there's less moving parts, there's and, no and they're complicated gonna electronics. Go, they're going to go digitize it for where like regulations require engine m- monitoring. So they've got, they've got like the entire spectrum of like everything that fuel injection and carburetors combined can do. The smart carb basically covers it. And it's fascinating to me that they've taken basic physics principles, like how a wing works for the um, the slide. And they're using that to do what we've sort of hacked with a computer. And we think fuel injection is like super sophisticated they've actually gone sort of beyond fuel injection in a way to, to just yeah. use basic physics to get even better at these, these simple things well i've i've been it's under wild. the illusion all this time you know thinking like i want to buy a new bike because my bike's a 2010 it's you know 12 years old now it's got ten thousand hours on it at least and you know just run through the mud yeah. and you know, I look at fuel injected bikes as thinking like this is the new technology. This is the stuff that's really going to make me, uh, you know, not not a better rider necessarily, but like it's really going to like solve a lot of problems for me. And in reality, like it couldn't be more wrong. No, I would. Uh, you're definitely buying a smart carb instead of a new bike. Oh, it's way cheaper. <laughs> way cheaper. <laughs> it starts to put the what is it, 800 bucks or whatever into perspective, right? Like, right. You compare that against managing a fuel injected bike um you know we a lot of the guys that we ride with put fuel pumps in and had to do injector cleanings and all sorts of other maintenance things well it's not just that okay if you buy a fuel injected four stroke like you did right 
um, well, in California, it's going to be California compliant. So it's going to have, That's it's going to be choked off. Yep. Uh, you're going to have to buy a, um, well, you got to put an $800 uh, computer in it to unlock it. it anyway. Yeah. You have to do that. Plus, right. a, plus a pipe. Right. And so you're looking at a thousand dollars right there just Easily. in no, uh, I, I performance was, parts just to get it to run like a dirt bike. W- with FMF and the get ECU, I was 1500 right. into comp- uh, engine management. Right. And like. you didn't even put like a new header on there. You took no. off the exhaust, no, uh, the, uh, the emission stuff. It's just engine management, which right. I've just done that on my, my two stroke for 800 bucks and solved the entire thing. So right. if you put that into perspective... Right. There's, right. there's no, there's no contest. It's not like it's an expensive part, right? It's going to make your life. If you ride a two stroke, you're not going to have to, uh, jet your bike. You're mm-hmm. not going to have to change it for the elevation, which I'm constantly having to do. And sometimes mm-hmm. I just get lazy and just be like, just oh, screw it. I'll just run with it rich. If I jet it for high ele- or low elevation yeah. and run it up high, like sometimes I won't even make the change just cause I don't want to do it. Um, the maintenance, right? Not having the jets, not having those small holes. Those are, uh, usability, features that change your experience riding um you know sort of like my complaint about tubeless sometimes is that it's fine it's it's a better system if you want to take the time to do the extra maintenance right right right. this is the opposite of that in that it's a better system and you have to do less maintenance or it's a better system because you have it's to rare do you get that combination right. right where you take out complication get better performance out of it and like and make your life easier right. at the same time usually it's like the get ecu you've got to go get maps and all this shit and figure out like which way to you know yeah. which, which switch to put and all that so really what it's going to come down to is you know at some point we'll do a long-term review of yep. the smart carb you've already got it in your bike i will have one in my bike soon um and we'll have to do a long-term review yeah. of it. You know, obviously, you know, the experience matters and, and we'll want to put right. it through the paces for a while and see if we come across anything that we hadn't thought of now. But at this point, to me, it seems like, you know, just a all around better system for fueling your bike. I've loved it so far. I've got it. I've had it for a couple of months. We just dropped my uh, very quick and dirty install video. Um, I've had a great experience. I mean, from start to finish, from install to ride, it's been fantastic. Um, and actually, I think it's kind of, it's funny because this is the first podcast. We've done 13 of these now. I've talked with a bunch of famous people who I'm like kind of starstruck by. And this is the first time I've felt a little bit silly asking questions because I know that my questions don't like compare to the level of expertise that the Smart yeah. Carp team, team brings to this and that Corey brought to this conversation. So we yeah. thank him for that. And um appreciate him bearing with our uh, lay people uh, yeah. <laughs> questions and, <laughs> and our uh, simplified explanations of everything. <laughs> God, these idiots. I can't um, believe you're asking me these questions. <laughs> Before we let you go, uh, I'm going to really quickly pitch the chin mounts that we make. Our editors told us not to belabor this point, so link in the descriptions and you cannot have a red one. Uh, that's it. Because that's the... Because it's a prototype. That's a prototype. And uh, Yeah, they're very cool. Yep. So go check out the links. Like and subscribe because these podcasts are a ton of fun. We drop them about once a month and you don't want to miss out on that one. We've also got some cool videos up about a bunch of other things around the bikes that we're building, which is where we put the smart carb. And uh, I think we have that's an it. Instagram channel and we do check cool out things. Instagram. Thanks for coming along with us.